Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Entrepreneur Center, where we help build businesses and connect you with the right people. I'm Karen Nowicki, and I am super excited about today's conversation, as I have gotten to know TJ Lowry a little bit by phone, and today she's decided to bring a handful of people here to support their mission with the Black HR Society. So welcome to the studio, all three of you. Thank you. you. Oh, in unison. It's almost <laughs> as if you practice that. And I was giggling and laughing before I, you know, had to find the right camera because it is so warm in the studio studio today. I had to open up the uh, the door, but maybe it's just me. So <laughs> I'm very excited about today's conversation, and I would love for each of you to introduce yourself, if you would, please, and the role that you play for the Black HR Society, and then we'll swing back around and give either TJ or all of you an opportunity to really talk about who you are, what you're doing, and and why this mission is so important for you. So, Brittany, I'm looking at you first. Since you're to my left, do you mind getting started for us? No problem at all. My name is Brittany Sedona, and I am the Vice President of Administration and Finance for the Black HR Society. My name is TJ Lari. I am the president of the Black HR Society. I'm Shatima Gresham. I'm the vice president of membership and professional development for the Black HR Society. And? And CEO of Procure (laughs) Talent Management Group. Cannot forget that. (laughs) Right. Love it. So, yeah, tell us who is the Black HR Society. And uh, really, we've got up to an hour for our conversation today, so don't be shy. So the Black HR Society was created as a safe space for Black HR professionals here in Phoenix. With the city being one of the largest uh, cities, the Black community is pretty spread about. Um, It's very difficult for us to find culture here. And a lot of people often say, there is no culture here. There is no Black people here. We're here. Um, You have to go out. You have to be intentional about finding them. When we created the Black HR Society, when you get in a space like HR, you tend to be solo. You're on an island. Um, You know, you're privy to certain things in the organization. And so there really aren't those close peers to share certain things with. And so here in this space, um, we share best practices. We share some of our challenges being Black in the workspace and also just our skills and abilities amongst each other. Our network, we share that with each other as well here. And so our goal is to to build the HR professional here, give them that skill set they need to grow and also get um, the equitable work they deserve. Mm, Fantastic intro. What did she leave out? (laughs) Anything else that you want to tag along with what TJ just shared? (laughs) No, I I think that, you know, sums it up as far as our mission and um, specifically just creating that space safe space within human resources. Um, Human resources encompasses a lot of different professions. And so, Being in an environment where you have like peers and are able to help you kind of navigate growth, um, specifically career pathing in that space, is one of our um, core missions that we are trying to provide. Mm -hmm. Anything else to add, Brittany? No, I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, Again, we put on different events um, throughout the year. So we have professional development events, um, networking events. Um, We're actually having an event coming up here shortly, a coffee chat, uh, where we'll just get together one morning. uh, It's Tuesday morning, February the 20th, actually. um, And we'll get together and just talk about just different things that are going on in in the HR field, specifically AI and how that's impacting HR. So we're really excited about that option. Yeah. Excellent. Well-rounded conversation just to even just get started. It's a nonprofit. Can you share a little bit about why you made the, the decision to go that route? Nonprofit is for service. Um, this is all about service in our community. There's a lot of organizations today, Karen, doing that. And so our goal is also to get out and connect with them, connecting those dots with organizations that's already pouring in the community make, makes us even richer and stronger. Um, and so we want to provide that service to the community. There's a lot of us that don't have access to get what they need. Um, and with a nonprofit, once we 
we get to that space where we're really bringing in the donors and the sponsors, we give them the A and the DEIA as far as that access. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people just can't get it, and so it's a, a longer crawl for them to get where they need to be, um, even without that we do that today, but we want to do that and have a bigger impact and make much more of a meaningful difference um, in the community. Mm -hmm. One of the things you and I had talked about when we spoke by phone after being at a Culture Crush event, I know Brittany and, and TJ and I had a chance to meet there, I think it was November? I mean, you and I got to see each other again in January, but was it back in November, Brittany? <laughs> I think, oh, it was actually in July. Oh, was it? It was. In July. Yes, because we were at Let's see, Arizona Wilderness mm -hmm. in the the big, uh, the where the brewery itself. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I love it. So one of the things that I remember asking is, are there other organizations, either for-profit or non-profit, that are doing similar work? I remember you saying the answer is yes, and how how well you work in tandem with these other organizations. So you can can you speak a little bit about that as well? Like who who is out there doing something similar, and and why does it make sense to just lock arms and do this together? So uh, there's a couple organizations that I'm very familiar with, one in AAAHR, and they are across the country. We started a chapter here of in AAAHR, AZ. It, it was a little bit difficult. They had a, a huge brand, Karen, but just trying to get the word out and the work um, was a little bit different. And so the Black HR Society rebranded the organization. We had the control internally. We were able to brand about more. So really what they've done is laid and paved the way. Mm -hmm. Now, again, they're in multiple states, Atlanta, Chicago. Um, so they're a very known brand. Uh, the Black, H Black in HR, they are one of our partners. When I started this organization, I immediately called Prathen and said, let's talk about what you've done, what is successful, what would be your advice if you could start over. Um, he gave me some great advice. They're product is a uh, for-profit, but they're also very um, online-centric where we have the mm -hmm. ability to be in person. And so he wanted to tap into that for his community that is in our area. And so um, they can become members of Black HR Society. The Black in HR uh, members become Black HR Society's members through our partnership. And so they are provided access and discounts to our events. Um, but there's other organizations that aren't doing exactly this work, and it makes sense. Um, the young professionals, I, I consider myself a honorary member of that organization. I've technically aid, aged out. They're part of the Urban League. But they do some wonderful events in the community, and anytime I can be a part of that, whether it's supporting the event, um, speaking to some of their members, um, they've done some wonderful things. And so it makes sense for us to leverage those, those partnerships. Mm -hmm. How did the three of you get to do this collectively together? Like, how long have you known each other, and and how did this come to be as as a I'll call it a partnership, for lack of a better word? Um, that's a funny story because um, I just met TJ and Brittany last year, so I joined uh, the Black HR Society in December of 2022. And it was because I was on LinkedIn and Brittany was socializing like posts of different uh, networking events and activities. And so um, I was never able to go to any of the events, but I kept seeing her postings and things like that. And so when I started my business, I was looking for an opportunity to just kind of give back and be a little more community focused as part of just the offerings. And I wanted to after being in HR for 20 plus years, I wanted to give back to us first. So I wanted to st strategically target, you know, underserved, under networked individuals first with just some of my talents and my expertise. And so as I kept seeing the LinkedIn posts coming through, I think I pinged Brittany and um, like right in the end of December, they were looking for board members. And I'm like, well, well, why not? So <laughs> I submitted my information and joined the board. 
join the board. I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, connections are very interesting. Interesting story for me as well. So how I met Shatima originally, I moved out to the Phoenix area and back in the end of twenty twenty. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> and so I met Shatima and connected with her on LinkedIn because she had put me in connection for a job. So I was interviewing with her. Oh. Yeah. Didn't even know her. I was interviewing with her. And so that's how we got connected. And I got connected with TJ because of the um, Urban League, Greater Phoenix Urban League Young Professionals. I was a member there. Just looking for community. That was something that I was really, really lacking coming from other places, coming from the South. It's very different here in Phoenix, especially when you talk about community put, in, put into the pandemic. Um, oh, right. So, the timing for you. Yeah. It was horrible. Um, and so I was ready to pack up and head home. And probably a month before I had one of my connections with Urban League um, mentioned that Black HR Society um, was kicking off their begin their first event. And it was going to be a hybrid event. Um, and so I was able to attend virtually. And right after they were saying that they were looking for board members because it was a new start to that organization. And so I jumped right in and I've been a part ever since. And so that was 20, that was the beginning of 2022. Mm -hmm. So I love those stories. Let's talk about your professional lives. I've had a chance to get TJ, to to know TJ a little bit better because we've had a a phone conversation that we've, we dove, we dove deep, didn't we? (laughs) We went deep really quickly. I, uh, I know, I know I tend to do that, but I have a sense that so do you. I do. It's just who I am. Right. I like those deep, rich connections and conversations. They're authentic. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what makes the three of you so great for the, this role, right? People are drawn to you, even just the way Shatima described how she just was drawn to you through LinkedIn. And thank goodness for um, professional places like yes. that when we are feeling isolated mm-hmm. or we in, or we have to be isolated like given our our days during COVID. So um, I would love to hear a little bit about each of you. Did you all grow up thinking that someday you'd be on Business Radio X talking about the HR Society, Black HR Society? And I say that jokingly, of course. Did you see yourself as a young girl and even a young woman doing the kind of work that you're doing today? How did How did you land here? So any one of you can start for us. I don't know if anyone, (laughs) well, you'll find that most HR people fall into HR of some Mm -hmm, sort. mm -hmm. I think now it's a little more common to go to the universities or colleges for um, HR courses. But if you are of a certain age, that was not available. So you did not, you know, sign up to take an HR uh, course. And definitely there was no degrees um, in it. You just kind of learn by whatever company that you were working for and, you know, someone mentored you in or you learned by trial and fire of, um, you know, human resources. So, And you've said you've been at it for, did you say 20 years? I have. I've been doing HR for about 20 plus years. You were seven when you started. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I love, because um, so we're at the Max 6 Entrepreneur Center and when you came in, we have the little sitting area just outside of Manpower and you said, oh my goodness, <laughs> those are some of your roots. Yes, good memories with um, Manpower. A shout out to Frank Armendaris, who um, I'm sure his title's escalated now, but he was the regional VP for their Phoenix office. So spent a lot of time in staffing, worked for Aerial Tech as well. But I started off in healthcare. So I started off at St. Joe's Hospital when it was Catholic Healthcare West and not Dignity. And then moved to uh, Gilbert and opened up Mercy Gilbert facility uh, in staffing. And then from there, I moved to the private sector. Wow, that's an impressive uh, Vita. <laughs> Very good. What do you love most about the work that you do? And then what do you find is the most challenging? Maybe not from your perspective as a professional, but but in, in just the work that you collectively do on behalf of companies. So what do you love most about it? And then what's one of the greatest challenges that you, you see folks experiencing? Yeah. So for me, the reason why I've stayed in human resources is because it is a position of service. It doesn't matter what you know, unit you are working in, you are providing service um, to employees, external applicants. And so I enjoy the position of service. Um, To piggyback on the original question, my degree is in human biology. So I thought I was going to become a doctor. 
And I had an epiphany moment during COVID because I'm like, what am I, what am I doing? Like, why am I still doing this? You know, we were getting laid off left and right. We were sitting at home. HR was, you know, awful during that time because we didn't know how to manage, you know, folks, you know, who were uh, on COVID. And um, I had an epiphany that even though I thought I was going to be a doctor for service, I've been doing exactly, you know, that's sole purpose I was still executing in human resources, specifically in recruitment and talent acquisition of helping people get a job, helping people, positioning them in the positions, you know, of their soul's desire. So Mm -hmm. making sure that the applicant was in the right position and the hiring manager was getting the best talent. So it was still moving in the same direction of service. And so that's why I'm still in um, human resources. And uh, the challenge, I would say, Um, which is the reason why I started my business, is that human resources as a department, we don't generate money, you know, in the traditional manner. So the ratio to human resource professionals, Mm -hmm. to the people that we're managing is always off. And it's very difficult to get a new Mm -hmm. (laughs) headcount if you get that. Mm -hmm. So in every role, in every company, I've had to beg for help or beg for additional support Mm -hmm. in delivering whatever the deliverable was, whether that was in recruitment or business partners. It sometimes feels like a position that doesn't maybe carry the same type of value for the roles that actually generate income. And um, that was always at least a frustration for myself. And I know, TJ, we've had this conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Lot. And that also, you know, you you do the research. We're the subject matter experts. We provide our suggestions and they say, OK, and they go a completely different way. <laughs> and most times we, we get to clean it up. You know, we, we then PR the message or we partner to. And we're fine with that. But there is that challenge of you know, I provided such good data and information and it it is a struggle when they don't take that. And I think one of the things we also talked about is in Shatima's space as a um, business owner, she can give it to them and walk away. And now if they don't take it, there's less of an attachment to it. When you're in the the grind, you care about the outcome a little bit more Mm -hmm. as opposed to she now owns that her own business. (laughs) That's right. She can wash, wipe her hands if they don't take, Mm -hmm. you know, our recommendation. Um, Because again, in my space when we we don't often HR practitioners have to then clean it up we mm-hmm. have to then that that's another layer for us so yeah the solo being solo dolos is difficult um I just saw a new Sherm study that said the new uh, data provided by ADP research says that there should be 2.2 HR practitioners um, 2.2 to 4.7 for wow. every 100. And it's likely one for a hundred. Am I? I'm guessing point three five. You know, point seven five. <laughs> yeah. In most cases, that's yeah. tough. So it, my yeah, my mind is going in a bunch of di- different directions, <laughs> and I want to make sure that I have a chance to have each of you share about your professional journey as well. Um, but before we leave this topic, so given that I've owned the studio for almost seven years now, and we've had just every industry, every vertical from the small business or the the solopreneur to large enterprise come through these doors, we have a lot of rich, very um, candid conversations about corporations and how they're run. And so while we're talking about some of the sticking points around HR and some of the, the, the challenges, I will say that when we have project managers come in here, they say the same thing. When we have somebody representing IT and the IT departments, they're saying the same thing. Or or for training and development, they're saying the mm-hmm. same thing. So I share that because I think it's important for our C-level executives mm-hmm. who are listening or even mid to upper tier managers when we can all be singing from the same sheet of music and we and we value the voices of those professionals and those expertise in those areas um, and do it with uh, respect then we can really achieve our goals a lot a lot quicker and a lot more harmoniously. So I just, you know, I just want to put that out there because I do hear some of the challenges from folks representing different departments, oftentimes like, you know, hey, we feel like we're working in a silo or we feel like we're doing this by ourselves and we've got incredible value to add 
And yet, oftentimes, it's our budget that's getting cut before everybody else's. So, well, Karen, yeah. I just want to add a, a thank you for saying that because in a lot of places, a lot of times, we it's tough to say what we said. You know, it's tough to say that's our challenge without then being looked at or what's the, the the backlash from us. But for them to have to hear you say it is, it, it's a consistent messaging. It validates that for us. It makes us feel like, thank you, mm-hmm. you know, because again, sometimes you just have to sit in it and deal with it, but we care about the outcome and that's why it becomes so frustrating. frustrating. So I agree if they hear us, um, maybe they, they'll take that insight and, and do something um, that'll work better for the good. Yeah. So thank you for saying yeah. that. So, Shatima, I want to go back to you again before we have these other gals share a little bit about their journey because your role as you became a business owner for yourself, obviously we've kind of highlighted why you might do that, right? So um, are you an outsourced HR uh, support that's how would you define your your business and and who is a great client for you? Sure. So Procure Talent Management Group is an HR consulting firm. So we specialize in talent management. And so what that is is the art of how you attract, hire, retain, and develop your employees. So that is our mm-hmm. sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's larger than just recruitment because attracting the applicant is about company culture. It's about your total rewards that you're offering. Hiring is obviously the recruitment pieces. Retention is a combination of all of that, but there are some best practices in retaining them now that you have them. And then obviously development is training. Mm -hmm. So that is our sweet spot. We also support short and long-term projects, so initiatives. So Pulling from just my experience of, you know, we got a new ATS system or HRS system, and we're already short staff in human resources. So I would ask for help, and I couldn't hire a new person, but they would give me a contractor for six months. Or we were doing end of the year audits, and I'm like, well, you know, we're kind of short staff already. We're recruiting, we're doing all this. Well, how long do you need it support? Do you need them for 90 days? Do you need them for six months? And so I was always able to get a contractor. I was always able to get temporary support. Hartley never got the full headcount, but I got the temporary support. So the core of it is those short and long-term projects. Um, It's usually a lot of the busy work. And so we partner with organizations to kind of take those tasks off of them and be, whether that's on-site support or virtual support in any of those other areas, whether it's project managing because they got a new system auditing um, in preparation for um, any upcoming um, events that they may have, or simple just uh, traditional consulting of going in and reviewing different processes, um, Mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, performance management, recruitment services, and things like that. Is there a specific industry that you serve or a, a certain size of a business? Is there a sweet spot? No, HR is pretty the same. Whether you're a company of two, you're going to have some HR things that need to be put in place or a company of a thousand. Um, so we are um, located here in Arizona, but I have national contracts. I have contracts in New York and California. Most of the HR function you can do virtual. COVID showed us that. Yeah, right. So no real sweet spot. I do have a personal Sweet spot for small businesses. So for companies that maybe can't afford a TJ to run their department, you know, um, I do like those because you're really kind of building from the ground up for them. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of speaks to my ego and my heart (laughs) in that space where some of the larger companies, it's a harder tug even for a contractor. I don't know why they put more value on my opinion than their VP or their director, but uh, sometimes Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. Yeah. Relation. What's that? The relation. Yes, yes, absolutely. So either of you can jump in there. So I, I just again to kind of reset the the uh, the question that I had shared originally. Tell us a little bit about your professional journey. 
And then um, what is that you love most about what you're doing and industry wide or even just you from the, the vantage points that you have, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges if, if it's different than what the, the gals have already spoken to? Okay. So for my career journey, it's the same. I, I wound up in HR. Um, I graduated with a degree in broadcast journalism. So thought that I would eventually be on the news or radio of some sort. And um, I graduated during the recession. So, yeah, I have all of the great things happening to me, recession, <laughs> COVID, all of it. <laughs> so um, I pivoted at that point, and I ended up in a sales role, more of a sales um, role. Some things happened. It just wasn't what I wanted to do, but it was more of a sales recruiting type of role. And so um, back in 2017, um, I decided to pivot again into recruiting within HR. And so that's how I started in recruiting uh, for HR. So I'm responsible for a recruiting team. I'm right now I'm currently a manager of a recruiting team um, for a charter school network. I really love my position within HR. I really like what I like most about the recruiting aspect is just being able to really meet new people and be able to help them. Um, I think so I would say probably the service part as well, like Shatima mentioned and TJ mentioned as well. I found that job seekers, I just know from the the candidate side of being a job seeker, how how tough and challenging it is. So I really enjoy being able to connect with folks and have that conversation with them. That is usually the answer that I will give to employers when I'm seeking a job and looking for a job. Personally, I would say to individuals that ask, you know, why do you like working in HR? I like it because People always hear HR and they say, oh, well, HR is for the company. It's not for you. It's not for the employee. Mm -hmm. I, for me, I work for the company and I work for the people as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very, I'm very much a rule follower. Um, so anybody knows that if you come to Brittany with a question, my question to you is going to be, well, what's the process? What, what's the procedure? What do we have in place? Oh, we don't have anything? Okay, well, we'll get something because we need processes. We need procedures. We need to be able to have those have those to function as mm -hmm. a successful business. So I just really enjoy that aspect of it, being able to help people and then help the company as well. Um, and I would just say the same things, you know, just the support uh, is the challenging part. The things that we can control. Mm -hmm. We can control employee life cycle, like your team mentioned, the talent management aspect, we can control that. So since we know that we can control it, what are we doing to make our employees want to stay with us okay. so that we're not having to recruit um, and hire for the same job every 30 days? Um, so right. it's getting that buy-in mm -hmm. um, from the, that C-suite um, that that's really something that is a challenge. Um, and I, I usually always ask that as well when I'm working with companies and going into a company. I just want to know. It's not saying that I'm going to um, shy away from the company, but I want to know what is your relationship like? What is the relationship like with the human resources department and the C-suite? What is the relationship like with the human resources department and talent? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, um, I don't know if you guys have run into this, but I've run into this a lot with companies. They don't look at recruiting as HR. Right. And it's very much a part. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Like yeah. the stepchildren. Right? Yeah. 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 Agree. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. TJ, how about you? So you started the question with, what did I want to be when I <laughs> yeah, grew yeah. up? Um I think like most people in my culture, we want to be a doctor or a lawyer as little kids because we're taught to get that financial wealth, to, to you know, stop the struggle. And as I grew up, you know, I loved math. I was into math very early, took two math classes a year in high school. So by the time I was a senior. <laughs> Shatima's um, nodding her head. So am I. I'm like, I can't even do two plus two. Side, you know, <laughs> in my calculator. senior year in high school, I was taking calc and trig oh and earning college credit. So I say that to say I knew I was in love with the numbers. And so I took an accounting course and I was like, this is it. I'm going to be an accountant. And I would get all the, you know, um, closing procedures right in the class in high school. And I would get a, an A and the teacher would write my name on the board. And I'm like, don't embarrass me. But I didn't care. I loved 
um, accounting. I, and so I, I took accounting as my career early on, really just enjoyed that. And I started working for a company in Wisconsin. We went through a rough time during the recession. And so we lost um, two thirds of our workforce. We went from 75 to 25. And so I started taking on the HR. You know, mm-hmm. I became somehow the HR lady, but I was also the accountant. I was their full time accountant. But I was also taking on HR and I loved it. And they would go say, go see the HR lady. And I was like, I'm an HR lady. <laughs> okay. You know, and it was just little bits of the new hire, the benefits. And so, that company ended up closing, going out of business, and I, I got a sign from God it was my time to leave. I didn't want to start over looking for a job at home, and I didn't want to be there anymore. And so I came here, um, and I had a fork in the road, like, do I go accounting, which is where my experience was, or do I, I do HR? And so I, I chose HR because I had a little PTSD, you know, going through a company that went through bankruptcy and just the trials of trying to keep the business open. Um, I, I wanted to explore HR. And so I work for a, a home health care company here, 2,000 employees, 10 states. Um, so it really gave me um, a huge and a, a big diverse entry into HR. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, I became the benefits specialist, which was unique. You know, I really only owned one specialty. Most HR practitioners will not. They don't like benefits. It's just mm-hmm. it's not fun until you see the ladies in the room going, "What? Well, go ask the benefits people. Mm-hmm. But it really gave me a unique skill set, but also tapped into my analytical side. There was a lot of analytics and benefits, especially when you're across yes. 10 states mm-hmm. trying to craft pro benefit plans to accommodate the staff. So that's how I got into HR. I love the company I was with, but my stepmom at the time was working in accounting over at the aquarium. And she said, you need to come over here. This is beautiful. And I said, I'm not looking for a job. I love the company I'm at. And all of a sudden things changed overnight. Um, And I mean, in terms of our department, and I think it was a sign. And so I called her back and said, put my resume in. And so before you knew it, um, I became the HR manager there, learned a lot, um, my current manager, he's the president of the aquarium, he committed to mentoring me um, from a manager into the role I am today because I came in asking for more. I said, you want all this. I I, I think I should be paid X. You know, mm-hmm. I had been coached and mentored to to really own my, my skills. And so he said, I can't give you that, but I can commit to you this path. And he did that. I was the manager. And seven months later, I was the director. And now I am the vice president of human resources for the destination. And we um, oversee nine attractions um, or seven attractions, two retail stores. Um, and we're a growing business. So that's my HR journey. I love what I do. Um, again, it is a service to the people. When I came in, I said, I want to be a valued partner to the business. And I find myself doing that. I, I partner with the directors. I partner with the executives, whether it's, let's let's look at the, whether there's a return to add two people to your department, or if you're going to get told, get out of here, you're being ridiculous. I kind of work with them. <laughs> I'm looking at stuff like that so we can really try and build a case. Um, and sometimes it is rough because they're going to say no. Um, and and you know that this is something we need to keep the, the culture healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, healthy cultures for me is important. I like to ask people what keeps you there for those employees mm-hmm. that's been there, you know, for a long time. Like the company in Wisconsin, I was there for 10 years and I had the least amount of tenure there was 15, 20. And so what keeps people there? And the common answer I hear, Karen, is they take care of me. Um, it's not the ping pong table in the break room? No. no. <laughs> it's, not. it's not the pizza, you know. Um, it, they take care of me. And what I also learned just this week is that's different to different people, Mm -hmm. right? What the definition of taking care of me means. Okay, very important distinction. That's right. We can't make an assumption about it's it's better pay, it's time off, it's hybrid. We can't assume, can we? No. No. And I learned that through a discussion with my president. I said, you know, we really want to look at the culture and and make this a great place to work. and, And people like to be taken care of. And we 
t- kind of deep dive into that. And I walked away saying, oh, huh, that's interesting. His take on what taking care of you versus mine. And I think it would be different versus a frontline mm-hmm. team member as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because you may have someone who benefits. They took a pay cut because I can tell you as an entrepreneur, paying out of pocket for benefits is like, Death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they come in and having those competitive benefits or, you know, they may have a sick family member. And so, you know, and I'm sure you see this, Brittany, when you're recruiting, mm-hmm. they those individuals, before you hang up, they're like, hey, wh- when does the benefits yeah. start? Yep. Yep. What are the benefits you provide? Because there's something that yes. they need where compensation may not be that driver as mm-hmm. well as the benefit offerings that they're, you know. That's looking right. for. I have a benefit cheat sheet because so <laughs> many candidates, that's important to them. And, yeah. you know, you don't want to give them a benefits guide that has, you know, 30 pages. Here's an overall cheat sheet that mm-hmm. cause that's important to people. But it's different, you know, different people. It is. It's different for different people, especially with me now with recruiting for charter school network. It's, it's the school system, right? So majority of the time, it's not going to be the pay. Um, It's not the pay that's going to keep people there. It's me talking to them, finding out, you know, my question is always to people, what is it? What is it? My question to myself that I always ask people, well, what's in it for me? What's Mm -hmm. the, what's my why? Mm -hmm. What do I need? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that it can be different for everyone. It's whether it's passion, whether it's a stepping stone. Um, But we definitely, the culture, I would say something that's, that's very important that a lot of of people sleep on. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting as each of you are sharing these little snippets or vignettes are passing through my mind and I don't know that they're real or not, but I I had this image, I think Shatima, when you mentioned it, of a parent or a guardian who has maybe a special needs child. Mm -hmm. And and there's going to be, you know, the IEP meetings Mm -hmm. or doctor appointments and that sort of thing. That, that why... Uh, is and culture fit is yep. very different from the guy or the gal that loves to travel mm-hmm. and right. can't wait to have some of that bulk, you know, pay t- uh, part t- excuse mm-hmm. me, paid time off or that time off or mm-hmm. whatever it is. And so it, it's really varied. Yeah. 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 Even the person who is looking for um, career pathing, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So Brittany alluded to that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're coming in and they want to know, hey, how do I, you know, I don't mind coming in here. How do I get here? Yeah, what right. does that look like? Or tuition reimbursement or just even sometimes I know what with some of my clients, you know, I talk to applicants, they want to be attached to the company. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's the brand to get on their resume that they work for the Odyssey sure. Aquarium or, you know, Manpower mm-hmm. Apple. Mm-hmm. That means something in their career pathing as well. So understanding that why when I was a recruiter, that's what I would sell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, benefits? Let me tell you about our benefits. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about that. Speaking their language. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Yeah. One of the challenges that kind of segues into this is the the evolution or lack thereof, right? You see companies in particular saying, well, you know, they just don't want to work. They, they do, but they want to work in the realms of their lives today, mm-hmm. which is different than what we were accustomed to. You Again, know? another gift of COVID, I really think. Yes. yes. I was going to say post-COVID, employers didn't want to evolve, and you have to. You have to evolve. You've got to give access even with DEI roles, I'm seeing it as a checkbox and not really doing the measurables and really doing the work because that means finding out what people need, finding mm-hmm. out what makes it easier for them to come to work and be successful within our, within reason for us as an employer, right? Because mm-hmm. sometimes it's a flex schedule. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's, you know, a hybrid day or, or whatever it is, and it may be simple enough, but we are stuck in, that's not what I, I did. That's not how it was. And you you got to evolve. you got to evolve and meet people people where they are um, so that you can keep them, so they can stay happy in their workspaces. Yeah, that's something that um, is one of the challenges right now as far as a lot of companies are wanting people back in the office. And a lot of employee or employees are like, no, no. I'm not doing it. It's a huge fight. <laughs> it's a fight. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. 
Talk about the, I was going to say lunch, but coffee. Talk about the coffee. It's again February. February the 20th. Okay. And, February the 20th. Yeah. And where is it and who's invited and how do they find out more and get registered? What What's the what's the 411? So the event is at Fleet Coffee. Um, I believe it's downtown area. Yeah. So coffee Central Church Street. Okay. So mm-hmm. centrally located. Um, we do have our Eventbrite information where they can go in and register. Um, the coffee chat is open. So it's not just for HR professionals. Um, we definitely want to if if people are coming that are in another industry feel free to come just chat um, it's just a time to just network talk about best practices um, and things that are going on in in the business realm overall mm-hmm. um, of course I said or like I said earlier we will be talking about AI and how it's impacting and affecting HR and you know any changes that are coming we'll be discussing that but there'll be other topics as well mm-hmm. um, it's just more of a casual environment um, but the Inventbrite information is on our LinkedIn as well as our um, Instagram and Facebook pages. Mm-hmm. So if anyone is on LinkedIn that wants to find us, we're at the Black HR Society. And then on Instagram, it's at Black HR Society. Mm-hmm. And then Facebook, the Black, the Black HR Society. So nice job, we're these. all Yeah, that's, it. that's <laughs> nice important. We need, to, we need to have all that. And is this the first coffee and you plan to do them again? So it was an evolution moment for me, right? I am a little on the older side, even though I, I read young. Um, I, oh, well, did you well, say you read young? I, I like do. that. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> me too. Because I, I, they always want to card me, and I love it. I'm like, yes, Oh, they're not carding me. me <laughs> but I love yeah. that. I Though I read I'm I'm going to borrow that, and I'll give you credit. So sorry to swoop that away it's from fine, you. Fine. So I, um, last year when the board came with this idea, um, I said, are people going to do that? Like, are we going to, because it's at 9 a.m., if I'm not mistaken, yeah. 9 mm-hmm. to 11. And so essentially, you kind of start your day with a coffee chat with us. And I said, are we going to really do that? It was a phenomenal event. We had a great turnout. Mm-hmm. The weather was phenomenal. Um, we all got coffee and sat outside, and the group was just really engaged. We mm-hmm. sat and talked about a number of topics. And so like you, kind of thinking more like a fireside chat Mm -hmm. where you hit it on the head or opening us up. You have that good cup of coffee and chat and have that rich conversation walking away feeling good about it. And then you can go into the work day. um, (laughs) Get um, a little dismantled and then (laughs) look for the next coffee date. Right. (laughs) Yes. It's a nice breakup in the day too. When you've been, you know, like you said, I I get up, make my coffee, sit there at seven, start going through those emails. So having that break and being able to network with like-minded people individuals and and it organically kind of came together mm-hmm. like we we all got our coffee and we were like in different seats and the next you know we were all together and there was multiple conversations it happening was. at the same time so it was a good it. event oh so brilliant and uh, get on eventbrite mm-hmm. uh and then is there you did say there is a website as well is it the black hr society no, it's it's through our Google domain. So okay. I would the but the easiest way to find us, I would say, go to our LinkedIn page, Perfect. Um, and you can find all of our information okay. there. Good, yeah. I appreciate the clarification. Mm-hmm. I know you all are incredibly busy, right? Because you're doing this as volunteers. Uh, in addition to managing your careers. Mm-hmm. Um, and TJ, you didn't even mention that you're a veteran. I am a veteran. Yeah, <laughs> share a little bit about that journey. So I came from, you know, humble beginnings, and I was a, a, a student, a strong student. I mentioned that earlier. And I just remember my mom saying, I'm not going to be able to to send you to college. And I'm going, what? You know, that, that was my way out. And so um, I remember a recruiter um, coming to the school and he then met with my mom and she signed off. I was 17. Mm. Um, and so I went to the military. Mm. I, I was also a track athlete and that military signing happened at the beginning of the school year. Track was at the end and I could have gotten a scholarship, but I signed. Now, early on, did I regret that? I was a little sad. Um, What if I had, you know, maybe this, but I'm very pleased about the journey, the layers that being a veteran has given me the skills, the the benefits, you know, um, a slew of benefits that you learn about, especially later in life as you grow. But I, I am, I'm a veteran. I spent years um, in the service, 12 years before I retired. I started as a um, small wheel mechanic, and I thought that would be 
cool to learn and take into uh, my civilian life. Um, I also did some uh, medical supply initially in communication. So when we were in the field, I learned how to hook up these radios. And um, it was all back old school. So it was a little bit more um, not as advanced as it probably would be today. But it just gave us communication if we were in the field. Um, so it was a great, rich experience for me. You do read young. <laughs> uh and you're also a licensed realtor as well. I am. I am. So when I moved here, I really had some different hopes and dreams and aspirations, but I also had to make a living. Um, and so I, I had to take on a job that I really wanted to kind of do some different things independently. But the the military provided a program where I could become, um, take a skill, and they would pay you for the skill while you were in the classes. I wanted to do culinary, but but you had to do that Monday through Friday. I'm still a good cook. Um, I just didn't get the <laughs> culinary stuff. Um, so I chose realty. I chose realty because I thought, oh, I love that. I could be passionate about that. And growing up, I was taught to have more than one income. And so they paid me to go to school. They paid me when I finished school. And then they gave me the down payment um, during that time for that program to buy a house. So it was, again, nice. a rich experience for me to, to do that. And I still do realty today. I've been a realtor since 2015, um, and I love it. I usually take on about two clients, maybe three a year, because I want to give them that white glove service. And, and most times, not always, they're people I know. Well, and I'd imagine, right, in your role uh, with the Black HR Society, homeownership is such a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so you have an opportunity to really have that uh, experience and that knowledge to share with people as it's Absolutely. it's their dream or their downsizing or whatever that situation is. You can be there as a, a co-pilot for them. Absolutely. I love it. How about Brittany and Shatima? Outside of HR life, are there hobbies or are there interests that, that you are passionate about? Yeah. So for me, outside of HR life, um, I don't have any kids just yet. So it's just me and the husband and the dog, our lovely dog, Gabby. She's our world. Um, and so... Outside of that piece, um, I'm very passionate and very um, active with the Great the Greater Phoenix Urban League Young Professionals. Um, so I have a, a board role with them as well. So um, it's a lot of board work for me outside of just work, but it's board work that I enjoy. And so even though it's working boards, we're still, you know, leadership development, uh, community service type events mm -hmm. and things of that nature that I'm able to pour into the community. So mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. Yeah. And is it Gabby you said is Gabby. your, your pup? What kind of dog? She's a Shih Tzu. She will be 14 oh, next month. Wow. Yeah. But she's doing well because that's, yeah, you get she nervous. is. I get nervous every year, around, every year around this time because it's time for her to go get her shots and Me it's, too. it's always something, but that's, that's my heart. She's, oh. I've had her for 13 years, so she's moved everywhere that I've been. <laughs> oh, so Sweet. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my heart. My healer shepherd thinks that she's a shih tzu. <laughs> and she is as, almost as tall as I am. <laughs> Shatima, how about that. you? What, what are your passions outside of things that are related to work? Well, I was trying to think, what do I do besides Uber for my son? Um, back and <laughs> right. forth. How old is he? He's 13 and he um, he's in club basketball. And I feel like that takes over any free time I could imagine or have with him. So beyond Ubering <laughs> in the evenings and sitting in a gym on the weekends, I every weekend, you. and um, we somehow punished ourselves and put him on a traveling team. So we'll be traveling uh, soon um, as well. I do volunteer with the Arizona Small Business Association. Mm. So I'm a mentor for them, for their Go Mentor team. And then I have a good friend who has a nonprofit. It's called D Square uh, for the Homeless. Yes. And um, I work with her um, doing some consulting, some of the business side pieces um, as well. So if there's some free time there, I usually do that with those two uh, organizations. Being a parent of an athlete is not for the faint of heart. My kiddo is 16. He's been driving since July 1st. I got to say, it's a little slice of heaven. Yeah. I mean, you trade you trade yeah. the you trade the time for the fear that yeah. they're driving and they're, they are, is he getting where, you know, following yeah. the app, I can mm -hmm. see his car going where it needs right. to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but boy, do I know sitting, uh, watching either club baseball and more recently wrestling matches that last all day long. And I love it. I wouldn't trade it. I'm glad right. I have the liberty and the time to do it. And right. yet it really is. It can be <laughs> <laughs> very consuming. Yeah. It can be rewarding. I had three 
basketball club and imagine having three and having to have them in three separate places. I had community. I had other moms. That also was my social life. Um, But my kids ended up with scholarships. And so there are also stairs. And I used to be like my mom wondering how was I going to afford college for them. And so um, two went to historical black colleges and on full scholarships. So it can be, you know, that. I need some reminders. I need you to. That's why I'm saying it because it's a lot of work. And even the money and the time. Oh, but for me, that return was it was valuable okay. because they got to play and and go on to well, think of me early that. Saturday mornings. <laughs> I might need that reminder to slide through my phone as I'm yelling at the refs because I'm also that parent. <laughs> Yes, B2. <laughs> Although Maybe. someone named Karen should never admit to giving anybody right. a hard time ever. Yeah. Gosh, when when the name Karen was really kind of like, the, you know, every meme, mm-hmm. fortunately, it's starting to die down. <laughs> I used to go to coffee shops and they'll say, what's your name with a cup ready to go? And I'd use my middle name, Isla. <laughs> But I did not want anybody to know that I was a Karen. I love it. Well, this has been just a fun and rich conversation. Um, As we close out today's segment, what would you say to um, a young professional, since you have been um, guides and mentors for folks in that position, around their professional journey in HR specifically? Is there just whatever comes to the top of your mind? What would you offer up as a, a little last piece of advice for someone? I would say stick to the course, um, definitely, and mentors. Mentorship is so, so important and so key. Um, Mentorship versus sponsorship, that's a big thing that a lot of people don't really understand the difference. Can you explain Um, that? Yeah. So for a mentor, a mentor is someone that's going to be like a guide and a helpful, like helping you out within your career development. So there's the person that you would talk to about where you're wanting to be within career mapping, and they can try to guide you and help you get to that space. A sponsor, that would be someone that's going to be able to speak for you, that is in that room. When those, they are the people that are at the table for those decision-making type things. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be the person that's able to speak to you when you're not there. Um, So that would be my suggestion um, and have both yeah, yeah. have both definitely have both um but and don't devalue um or, or a lot of young professionals are scared to um network and put themselves out there and if no one will know what you want until you say it yes closed mouths don't get fed right you miss 100 percent of the shots that you don't take so you have to go in uh, be bold be confident in yourself and your abilities. You can do it and just stick with it. Well, we'll just end there. No, just kidding. We could. <laughs> no, we I could just that, end there. Right? Mic drop. Yes. That was how about so good, it? Really Brit. was fantastic. I, I want to add everything she said to mine. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And in speaking to that sponsorship, I think that was really good. You know, just knowing and saying that to them, saying have that person that can be at the table because we don't know what that means going mm-hmm. into a workplace. We just know to put our head down and do the job. Mm-hmm. But building those internal relationships because those are the people can advocate and can get you on the path. So I, I think that was great. I, I add my personal board of directors. Like she mentioned, you know, I create a board of directors personally for my career, for my personal life. They know things that are happening. I recently added Robin Reed. Um, he kind of said to me he would do that. And it's easy. He's got a lot of knowledge. And so those those people will help you on your journey. And like Britt says, stick to the course. Sometimes you you get the imposter syndrome that sets in and, you know, you start to have the doubt, but you got to remember that there is a light and you can get there. So beautiful. Before Shatima shares with us, I would like to give a shout out to Robin Reed. You and I talked, you had, yeah, no. you hadn't met him yet before we talked, right? I, and you had a coffee or something scheduled with him. So many have me. I met him at the first Culture Crush. Yes. We okay. all That's were right. in July. He was a panelist. Mm-hmm. But when we were meeting, I had had a meeting scheduled yes. with him that same week. So I've seen him since then. And as we were coming from the green room and walking towards the studio day, I had said to you, I really want to have you guys go watch STN at sure. some point. So Robin hosts one of the okay. segments for STN, I along with that. Monica Vill- Villanova. So I hope I pronounced her last name correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she is the president for the Hispanic Chamber. Mm-hmm. And it's so fascinating. Robin's only been in here one time. 
we've met a couple of times uh, just, you know, out in different networking events. And he left a voicemail for, for me the other day. Uh, I think it was like 7.30 at night, just two or three days ago. And and I t- shared this story with you, TJ, about Daryl, uh-huh, who used uh-huh, to produce for uh-huh. us. I won't go into the long-winded story, but the four of us can talk about it after because it's such a beautiful story. Robin called just to say to me, I have some great news about Daryl and his career path. Mm-hmm. And while I could tell you, I would like for you, I'd like to encourage you to call Daryl yourself uh-huh. because I think he would love to share with you. And what? We've only met a couple of times, and he's such a busy leader, like myself and like the three of you. And yet, you, I feel like I'm the most important person in the conversation with him every time I've spoken to him. And yet, I see that demonstrated over and over and over again. So, shout out to our friend yeah, Robin Reed. Shout out to Robin. Yes, he's a good guy, smart, you know, connected, and just he he's out to help us. And that makes us feel good because you look up to him, you know, so that's a great story. I love it. Yeah. How about you? I mean, I don't know what else to add (laughs) to um, TJ and um, what Brittany say. I think whenever I speak to anyone who is looking um, specifically in career pathing or interviewing, I tell them to do their research and negotiate. Mm -hmm. Everything is negotiable. We just don't ask. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, very good. Ladies, so fun and so important, the work that you're doing and just the connection. It's it's clear that the three of you are passionate about the folks that you represent, the way in which you are showing up as servant leaders, and the invitation to have come people run alongside you is just beautiful. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you bet. You You've been listening to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Entrepreneur Center. Some media leans left, some lean right, and we lean business. Until next time, I'm Karen Nowicki. Thanks for listening. <laughs>